So welcome everyone and thank you for attending our brunch series, um, the first one in 2022. Uh, my name is Sagalan and I'm joined by Natalie Bull this morning who will kick off uh, the brunch with a talk on fact-finding hearings. So I'm just going to introduce her before we get started. Natalie was called in 2004 and she practices exclusively in family law. She's ranked as a leading junior by the Legal 500 in both areas of her practice, namely child law and finance. Natalie has considerable experience of fact-finding hearings and has a particular interest in complex cases involving intractable contact disputes. So without further ado, Natalie, take us through the fact find. Brilliant, thank you very much, Segalen. I'm You're welcome. going to share my screen. There we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so welcome to my talk on fact-finding hearings, um, tips and tricks. This is aimed at private law, but some of the content can be applied to public law. So today's agenda, we're going to be looking at reasons and necessity for listing fact-finding hearings, Scott schedules, definitions, evidence, case management and appeals. The most common reasons for fact-finding hearings, more often than not, there are allegations of domestic abuse by the victim parent or allegations of harm to the child, either physical harm such as inflicted injury or sexual abuse. Allegations can also relate to intractable hostility to contact. Why is it necessary to explore domestic abuse between two parents? Well, as per practice direction 12J paragraph four, domestic abuse is harmful to children. Children may suffer direct physical, psychological and or emotional harm and may also suffer harm indirectly where the domestic abuse impairs the parenting capacity of either or both of their parents. There is an obligation on the court to consider whether domestic abuse is raised as an issue. It's therefore important prior to the FEDRA to have taken full instructions from the client as to whether a fact-finding hearing is sought and set this out in the position statement for the first hearing. The court must identify the factual and welfare issues, the nature of any allegation, admission or evidence of domestic abuse, and importantly, the extent to which it would be likely to be relevant in deciding whether to make a child arrangement order. It is essential for all practitioners to keep in mind how the allegations are relevant to the overall application and what, if any difference, a finding would make to the final child arrangement order. We've probably all come across cases where historic allegations are raised, but since the relevant date, contact has progressed by mutual agreement, the children enjoy spending time with a non-resident parent, and no further incidents have occurred. In such circumstances, clear pragmatic advice should be provided at the outset that the finding is probably unlikely to change the final child arrangement order. As set out in practice direction 12J paragraph 16, a fact finding hearing has to be deemed necessary by the court for it to be directed. The grounds are either to provide a factual basis for any welfare report or assessment, to undertake an assessment of risk before finalising any welfare based child arrangement order or considering an activity such as the domestic violence perpetrators programme. When considering the necessity of a fact finding hearing, the courts should consider all the circumstances of the case, including the views of the parties and CAFCAS any admissions which provide a sufficient factual basis on which to proceed, whether the evidence provided for a legal aid certificate provides a sufficient factual basis on which to proceed, any other evidence available providing a sufficient factual basis on which to proceed, and continuing here, the nature of the evidence required, the relevance of the allegations, and whether a fact-finding hearing would be necessary and proportionate rather than a composite final hearing. 
Pursuant to practice direction 12J, paragraph 25, where a fact-finding hearing has been directed regarding domestic abuse, an interim child arrangement order should not be made unless the court is satisfied that it is in the interest of the child to make such an order. In applying this provision, the presumption appears to be against interim child arrangement orders, and it is on the respondent to the allegations to satisfy the court that an interim order should be made. If an interim child arrangement order is made, the parent making the allegations and the child must be safeguarded by the order, including their emotional well-being. When considering interim child arrangement orders, the welfare checklist must be taken into account, as well as any risk of harm to the child and the alleged victim. The court should ensure any risk of harm is minimised. It's worth noting that minimising risk is clearly different to eradicating any risk, which is obviously an argument for use by respondents. It's commonplace for interim spend time with arrangements to be supervised in order to minimise the risk to the child. The court should consider the availability of supervisors and facilities. That doesn't necessarily mean contact centres. It could be a relative's house or a public place accompanied by a relative or trusted third party or by an employed independent supervisor, which obviously comes with a financial cost. The alternative to interim direct contact is, of course, indirect contact, either telephone or video calls where possible, or letters and cards. It's important to include a direction requiring the resident parent to promptly read or show the indirect contact to the child and encourage the child to respond by drawing pictures or cards. Uh, it's also important to direct the resident parent to send updates about the child to the non-resident parent, maybe every six to eight weeks or so, to enable the non-resident parent to cater their communication to what is relevant to the child to engage them. Otherwise, it's very difficult for non-resident parents to know what to write about each time. In some cases, contact may not be considered beneficial to the child. For example, the child is struggling and has voiced clear concerns not to have any contact, in which case it may be better to have the fact-finding hearing before then deciding whether any work needs to be done to assist the child and or potentially to help rebuild the relationship with the absent parent. It's commonplace for an opposing party to use the arguments listed here against a fact-finding hearing. In combating those arguments, non-molestation orders and undertakings are, of course, time-limited, thereby there is no protection for the victim after that time. They are often made on a non-admission and non-findings basis, so there, there is no factual matrix from which to assess risk. The allegations may be from a time of the relationship and arguably separation may mean there have been no new instance, but the victim may still be vulnerable to abuse, for example, at handovers or through communication, and the children may witness or pick up on the anxieties or feelings, and this may cause over time a reluctance on their part to attend contact. Children may have had contact since the alleged instance, but one of the concerns may be that as the children grow and test boundaries, they could be placed at risk of harm by a parent who has anger management issues. In re-HN, the Court of Appeal, with a bench including the President of the Family Division, made much comment about the nature of fact-finding hearings and the need to ensure that full consideration is given by a court faced with allegations of domestic abuse. The court helpfully set out the proper approach to deciding if a fact-finding hearing is necessary through applying the practice direction, which we've already considered in the previous slides, together with the overriding objective and the president's guidance. Paragraph 37 of the judgment, as set out in this slide and the next slide, contains a useful summary of the proper approach, which representatives often find helpful to quote in position statements. 
At paragraph 38, the court expressed the benefit to Kafka's involvement beyond a safeguarding letter in order to assist the court to determine the necessity of a fact-finding hearing. In HN, Kafkas had offered additional support to the court when deciding whether to hold a fact-finding hearing. Kafka suggested that the judge should direct an enhanced form of safeguarding assessment, including meeting the child where appropriate prior to a second gatekeeping appointment to allow for a more informed and child-centered listing decision. The Court of Appeal suggested that the proposals made by CAFCAS justified close consideration by those charged with reviewing Practice Direction 12J. There may well be an amended procedure to Practice Direction 12J in due course, although one inevitably questions how this would be possible in practical terms when CAFCAS are currently struggling to cope with demand. We can only wait and see what happens. Scott Schedules, where are we now? Um, the case of F and M questioned the use of Scott schedules, but ultimately stated that it would be a matter for the judge and advocates in each case. In my own practice, I've seen the continuation of the use of Scott schedules as the court generally finds it helpful, having a concise schedule of numbered allegations. The difference has been that judges are open to, to allegations of coercive control not being itemised in the schedule other than a headline with the background and detail to that allegation set out at length in the statement. The case of HM made it clear that limiting the number of allegations is a potential barrier to fairness and good process rather than an aid. Paragraph 44 of the HN judgment made it plain why the focus should be on the wider context of whether there has been a pattern of coercive and controlling behaviour, rather than a list of dates and times, as it's likely to have a cumulative impact on the victim. At paragraph 45, the court explained that by reducing down the number of allegations means there is no consideration of a pattern of behaviour, and that if only those limited allegations are proved, only those allegations form the factual matrix and inform the assessment of risk, which is therefore distorted and potentially unreliable. The Court of Appeal urged serious thought into developing a different way of summarising and organising the issues so that the case is clearly spelled out for the respondent to respond to, but does not, not distort the focus of the proceedings where the allegation relates to a pattern of behaviour. In my own practice, I found that judges are no longer limiting the number of allegations or if they do start to suggest this by referring them to the recent case law, they can see that limiting allegations is not appropriate. It is noteworthy that the harm panel had expressed the same concern about limiting the number of allegations to the detriment of the court, not being exposed to more subtle and persistent patterns of behavior. The work of the private law working group and the harm panels implementation group may in due course lead to a change to the family procedure rules or the, the issuing of fresh guidance. Where Scotch schedules are used, it is important that they are properly pleaded. Um, where allegations relate to incidents that took place on specific dates and times, that should be stated. When police have been called, that should also be stated. It should essentially be a concise tabled schedule, which is very different to a statement. Uh, save the lengthy details to the statement. Limit each allegation to a few bullet points of essential facts in clear terms that the respondent can easily respond to. Be aware that the more detail that is provided in the Scott schedule, the more risk there is of inconsistencies being identified at a later stage after all the evidence has been considered and a full statement is prepared and any inconsistencies are of course likely to undermine credibility. If coercive control is alleged, include that as a subheading within the schedule stating the time frame that it's spanned from, but with all the detail being provided in the statement. 
Moving on to definitions, um, I've included some useful definitions which should be borne in mind when pleading the allegations. I won't through, read through them, but they are here for you to refer to. Uh, they include domestic abuse, which has a very broad definition, abandonment, coercive behaviour and controlling behaviour, development, harm, health, ill treatment, a more specific definition for controlling behaviour and also coercive behaviour and financial abuse. And then we have some examples of psychological and emotional abuse and sexual abuse. Moving on to evidence, cooperative evidence. Um, if the police have been called, even if no criminal proceedings resulted, it's essential to seek a police disclosure order at the earliest hearing to avoid delay. It generally takes longer than 28 days for the disclosure to come through, especially after waiting for the sealed order, which most police constabularies insist on having. Provide as much detail as possible on the police disclosure order regarding dates of instance, names, dates of birth, addresses, crime reference numbers. Um, it's also important to obtain contact details for the disclosure officer and consider which documents you might need, which might not necessarily be produced straight away, such as a probation report, notebooks and transcripts of AB interviews. Medical evidence, the victim may have either sustained physical injuries or mental health difficulties due to enduring the abuse to seek disclosure of medical records where necessary and a letter from their GP. Health visitors um, keep family records and individual children records and these are not always the same. The difference can be important. If women's aid are involved, a supportive letter can help setting out the victim's presentation and the history provided by the victim. Social media, it may be necessary to obtain an order if necessary, um, particularly for Facebook evidence. As a word of caution, often clients think that social media evidence paints them in a positive light when the reality may be quite different. Therefore, social media evidence should be carefully considered before being disclosed with caution. Text or other communication either between the victim and abuser or the victim reaching out to family or friends or employers can be helpful. Try to avoid attaching reams and reams of texts, limit the text to the essentials. Photos of injuries, uh, videos or uh, audios capturing the abuse can be helpful. Or for the respondent, videos counteracting the allegations. For example, from my practice, videos of a couple alone on holiday together, evidently enjoying themselves in each other's company, when the applicant had claimed that she was terrified of him and would never spend time alone with him, undermined her account. Also, where a child claimed that she was miserable during contact sessions due to being emotionally abused by the father with threats of violence, several videos spread throughout the contact day showing a very happy child on the date that an alleged incident took place greatly assisted the court. Witnesses, um, independent witnesses are clearly best, uh, which would not generally be family, but if family have witnessed, for example, physical damage caused by the perpetrator, that can be important. Employers are generally not in independent, but may have assisted the victim at a time of need by allowing time off work after incidents have occurred. For respondents, close mutual friends or housemates may be able to be helpful in giving evidence against alleged abuse or coercive control. There may be no cooperative evidence, in which case it is essential to examine the client's motive and credibility and consider how they'll come across in the witness box before proceeding. Always remember the burden of proof is on the party making the allegation and therefore without any corroborative evidence, it's one party's word against the other, which is a very difficult starting position to be in. ABE, um, where allegations of physical or sexual abuse have been made and the police are involved, there's a statutory guidance for achieving best evidence in criminal proceedings known as ABE guidelines, which includes listening free recall of events and asking open-ended questions, not leading or multiple questions. 
if a parent seeks to rely upon an audio recording they've taken of a child making disclosures or allegations, consider whether the audio evidence follows the ABE guidelines. This will have an impact on the weight placed on that evidence. As a word of caution, generally the court is very critical of parents for recording children for the purpose of gathering evidence, which of course can be harmful. A difficult allegation is sexual abuse of a child, which often has little if any evidence. It's worth reading the Royal College of Pediatricians and Child Health Report on the physical signs of abuse. Case management. The, under the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, perpetrators of abuse are prohibited from cross-examining their victims in person, and there is a statutory presumption that victims of domestic abuse are eligible for special measures. This applies in the criminal, civil and family courts. Uh, special measures typically include separate waiting areas and screens in the courtroom, or if remote, there is a facility through CVP, which enables the judge to see all the parties, but hides one party from sight of another party. Other special measures are, of course, available depending on the requirements. At trial time estimates. Um, it is really important to provide a realistic time estimate to avoid further delays caused by having to adjourn the fact-finding hearing due to insufficient time being allocated always allow for judicial reading time and for the judgment um, inevitably you will not usually have a clear start there are likely to be housekeeping issues for example bundle problems or a lack of a witness bundle in court it can be midday by the time you've, you've got the case ready to start by which point you've lost a significant proportion of the listing time Magistrates court especially uh, will not generally be prepared to start and then risk being part heard due to real difficulties in relisting the same justices. Try to arrange a conference with trial counsel to get an accurate time estimate before the fact finding hearing is listed. The cross examination time estimates will depend on the number of allegations. Uh, for example, it could take uh, a whole day for each party in a complex case. Uh, to be cross-examined or uh, where a party requires an interpreter to give evidence. However, some courts are being very strict on listing times. Um, as an example, one of my recent experiences of this was in Coventry, listing a fact-finding hearing before a DJ with four witnesses, including the parties. Only two days was permitted by the court, with no examination in, in chief was permitted cross-examination was to be limited to allow the trial and judgment to be concluded in the allocated two days you're therefore at the mercy of the court uh, pre-trial reviews in my view are essential and must be listed before the same trial judge with trial counsel approximately two to four weeks before the fact-finding hearing to address any preliminary issues and to ensure the fact-finding hearing will be effective and run smoothly the burden of proof lies on the party making the allegation. The seriousness of the allegation and of the consequences should not make any difference to the standard of proof to be applied, which is on the balance of probabilities. Findings of fact should be based on the evidence and the credibility and reliability of the witnesses and parties. Findings should not be based on speculation. The binary system applies, either it did or did not happen. The court should make findings as to the nature and degree of any domestic abuse and its effect on the child or parents. The findings must be recorded in the schedule and then sent to CAFCAS. The court must consider, notwithstanding any earlier direction for a Section 7 report, uh, whether it be in the best interest of the child for a further Section 7 report. Depending on the findings, a direction for the perpetrator to attend a course to address their behaviour and thereafter return for review. Costs can be sought, unlike other Children Act cases, but there is generally judicial reluctance to making cost orders. Where the court has made findings of fact on disputed allegations, any subsequent hearing should be conducted by the same judge. The only exceptions to this 
is that there would be delay to the planned timetable uh, for reasons which must be recorded in writing uh, that the detriment to the welfare of the child would outweigh the detriment to the fair trial of the proceedings. Any interim contact must not expose the child or victim to risk of harm and must be in the best interest of the child. Appeals quickly run through. Uh, in FNM, the Honourable Mr Justice Cobb said at paragraph 19 of his judgment that appeals against findings of fact are notoriously difficult. He stated, as an appellate court, I would only be able to say that the judge who has conducted a fact-finding exercise had erred materially if the answer was demonstrably contrary to the weight of the evidence or the decision-making process can be identified as being plainly defective so that it can be said that the findings in question are unsafe. He was referring to Mr Justice Mostyn's 2011 case of NG and SG. JHMF was an appeal heard in the High Court by Miss Justice Russell DBE, and a vast number of criticisms were made of the trial judge, His Honour Judge Tolson QC, as listed in this slide and the next slide. Looking at the time, I don't have time to read through those, but it's definitely worth a read. The appeal was therefore allowed. At the end of her judgment, Mr Justice Russell stated that she had made an urgent request to the president who's going to make a formal request to the Judicial College for those judges who may hear cases involving allegations of serious sexual assault in family proceedings to be given training based on that which is already provided to criminal judges. She went on to say this is a welcome development or a cross-jurisdictional approach to training on this important topic topic will be of assistance, support and benefit to all judges and will foster a more coherent approach. Well, my talk ends on the positive note of future coherent approaches by judges. Um, I hope my talk was of some interest to you. Do feel free to send any questions to me on the chat function and I'll do my best to answer them either in writing or at the end of the seminar.